All right, welcome to our August 2022 technical training meeting. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, here's the agenda for today's meeting. As usual, just have a couple of training opportunities, a little bit of new business, and then our main topic for today is we're going to do a, uh, a technical monitoring review and preview. This is uh, similar to what we've done in August for the last couple of years. Just basically, this is where Dalton and I are going to uh, share with you our you know, some of the top things we found during our technical monitoring this year and then what we're going to be looking for going forward. So for training opportunities, I've got two things listed here. One of them is just in two weeks from now, we are doing our the, a BPI EA QCI training and certification. That's a class where we limit that to four people. I've already been in contact with the four people that who will, who will be attending the class, so you should know about it. Um, if you need that class soon and I have not been in contact with you, then shoot me an email. We probably need to talk. Um, the, the other one I want everybody to be aware of is we are going to do our Energy Otter 101 class this October. And this was this is the four-day class where I will teach you how to use the energy audit tool. We go into great detail. You'll run a full energy audit. Um, it's it's a it's a great class if you are looking at becoming an energy auditor or a QCI. You that it is a requirement to you have to take this class before you can take that the training and certification class. Um, but also if you just need to know more about it, uh, we've had a lot of program coordinators and others take that class just to really wrap their head around how the program works. Um, but basically, registration for that class is open now. And the way you register, you just send me an email. Let me know that you'd want to attend. So if you want to attend, make sure you have your supervisor's permission, your coordinator's permission, and shoot me an email, and I'll put you on this on uh, the uh, list of attendees for that class. I don't limit that class. Um, I've had, I think, 12 or 14 people in the class before, and, and it works great. So we, we can have as many as need to come. Um, but I will probably close registration in uh, about a month from now because I will start pushing out. There's some homework that has to be done before you join the class. Uh, that homework, all it is, it it's important, but um, what it is is you have to run one full energy audit before you join us. So you have to go, whether that's a client's home or your own home or your grandma's home, you do have to run an energy audit. I want you to have gone through the process at least once before we sit down and, and do it in class. Any questions on the training opportunities? Hey, um, Dalton, are you on in-person or are you doing it virtually? Oh, good question. We are going to hold that in person. So that will be at the training center in Clearfield. It is a four day class. Um, so yeah, if, if you're going to come up, you will probably want to get make plans now to and get reservations and things like that for a hotel and stuff. I have a question, Matt. Yeah. Um, where we're going to be transitioning to the new online version of Meet, how will this help us prepare for that? Will it, will it help us prepare for that? There is a high likelihood that we will be doing this class using that new audit tool. Great. So I, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Um, the new audit tool seems to be working well enough. I think we're going to, if not, completely in the new audit tool, everything that we possibly can in the new audit tool. So it's not a huge lift. Like the new audit tool is not that much different. So if you're pretty if you're a pretty solid auditor, I wouldn't stress about it. But you know, like you don't need to drop everything and come to this class to try and learn the new audit tool. But um, if you need to learn the audit, this is a good class for you and and there's a very high likelihood we will be using the new audit tool to do it. So any other questions? All right. So the new business 
some of you probably read down below and noticed. Dalton, you want to tell us what this one's all about? Yeah. Um, so I took a position with um, Jess Peterson. He works, he's a manager over the Only Walker Housing Fund here at the um, our division, HCD. So I'm going to be leaving weatherization and joining his team. Um, I'll still be working for the division and the state, but uh, yeah. So that's going to start. I'm going to be starting with him on the 29th of August, so here in a couple weeks. So, Dalton, uh, Dalton's leaving us. Bummer. It's been, it's been uh, a good good 14 years working weatherization. I've enjoyed working with everybody in weatherization. So. Uh, stay in touch with me. I consider y'all friends and yep. So. Well, sorry to see you go, Matt. It's it's a bummer, but it I think he's gonna be on to new adventures and it'll be good for him. So he's definitely leaving a gaping hole in our uh, program, but um but that's the next bullet point there. We do have a couple of new guys that we will utilize to try and fill that void. Um, Matt, I don't know if we, have we introduced you to the group yet? I Not formally, no. Okay, so Matt Rogers, who has been in, in weatherization in the past, he worked for Tri-County and also for MAG, and then I think went off to the Air Force somewhere in between, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, so we're happy to have him on on our state team. He joined us, I don't know, a month or more ago. In June, yep. Okay, yeah, it's been a little bit. So he, he's been working with us for a little while. And then we also have another new team member, Justin Davidson. You can see there. And he's been with us for about, what, 24 hours? Uh, 36. 36 hours? Yes, sir. So... Justin, do uh, you want to tell the folks where you come from or say hello real quick? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Justin Davidson. I believe I came from my mom, but I'm not for sure. I spent some time as a non destructive tester in the past five years. I was a training coordinator for a small refinery uh, that was in Washington. I'm originally from Utah, so I moved back home. I'm really fortunate to have this opportunity and work for all of you, work with all of you. Cool. So welcome, Justin. You'll see these guys um, as we're out uh, providing monitoring and training and things. And as their responsibilities become clearer, then uh, we'll try to communicate with you. You know, at, at what technical aspects of the program that you'll need to be in in contact with them and stuff as we move forward. But right now, they're just busy getting lots of training and, and uh, getting up to speed on some things. So I look forward to it. Mm. Uh, other new business items. I, I sent out a few weeks ago, I sent out a video to clarify where we are at on lead. I hope that each of you received that and more importantly that you watched it and that you're implementing it. If you have not seen that video, take the time after today's meeting to watch that video just search in your emails from me it'll just say something about clarification on lead the two main takeaways from that video are right here you are required to test all painted surfaces that will be disturbed and the the 6 and 20 de minimis rule that is in epa's lead uh, it does not apply to weatherization. As we've gone back and, and reviewed the guidance on that, we it is clear to us that that will never apply to weatherization. And so it really, in essence, means that we have to raise the bar a little bit. I have to raise the bar a little bit. So as I've been out monitoring you guys, uh, I thought that that rule applied. So if you thought that rule applied, I've allowed you to get away with that. When I come out and do this year's monitoring, I can't do that. So we are essentially raising the bar to what we should have been doing all along. But 
Does anybody have any questions on, on the guidance in that video? Or any concerns? All right, I, I've only fielded one question about it from the network, so. We may have one question. Yes. So in the past, the auditors have been able to drill holes to check for insulation without testing for lead paint. Is that going to be different now? I am, I did not catch your question. So in the past, when the auditors in the field and they're checking for insulation and well, they've been able to drill a hole to check for insulation. Do we need to check for lead paint before they drill the hole now to check for lead paint? That's a good question. And the way I read this, the answer is yes. Okay. At which I realize it looks messy it makes things more difficult but yeah if you are going to disturb any lead paint you must test it first and if there is lead paint you must do lead safe weatherization so then they would have lead weatherization pictures to verify that they did that before checking for insulation in the audit correct okay yeah. and so yeah what carrie lynn brings up is a great question because it's a very small amount of paint that we will be disturbing but it it uh, illustrates exactly what we need to do. Um, the other area where there, I will be watching more closely is uh, when we're putting in fans and bathroom ceilings, you got to make sure that you have tested the paint on that ceiling. That So auditors, that that those tests must be on your uh, lead tests when you're doing them. Um, and so anyway, any other questions on that one? What about like the jam up kit issue? If you're just screwing a jam up kit to a lead frame door, are you supposed to do lead safe work just to put the screws in? It's a good question. Are you going to be disturbing lead paint? There is a screw in the wall, but apparently a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I don't know any other way around it. I, I, again, I realize how what that may look like in the field, but. If we are disturbing lead paint, we must do the necessary containments and uh, lead safe work. So. Yeah, because what, what's kind of happened is the RRP class, they always talk about that the minimus rule and stuff. And so it's confusing when you go take the RRP class because they, they try to use that. But when we went back and reread the rules, it says weatherization work and it says weatherization in it weatherization work it does not fall under the de minimis rules so we're kind of back to that point where we were a few years ago where there was the rrp rules plus doe had their own lead safe for all the stuff that was under the de minimis we're back to that point where we're just going to have to test everything and do lead safe work on everything anything that has lead so yeah um and and really i even though there may be that desire to try and find a shortcut or a simple way uh we need to avoid that if you need to do a containment do a containment we have the money we have the, the resources we have the time um and that that brad felt very very strongly as we were reviewing this the same thing with we have xrf guns why are we not lead testing stuff to make sure that we're keeping our guys safe and keeping our clients safe so uh, and and he is correct like as i went back through and read it i as, as much as i wanted to i could not make a an argument to do anything other than what we're asking you to do so uh, all right. The last thing I had on new business was that just I'm going to be sending out a survey to this group about the forms and the, you know, the documents you guys are using. I would like to try and gather a little bit of information about what formats work for you and what doesn't work for you. I'm going to be working on a little bit of a project um, to hopefully improve some of the forms that we we use. And so I'm just looking for some feedback from those of you who actually use the forms. 
so just watch for that. It's just going to come as an email, and when you see it, just take a few minutes, and if you'll give me some honest feedback, then that will uh, help to play into the whatever improvements we're trying to make. So anyway, anybody have anything else before we jump into the main topic today? Any other concerns or questions? All right. I don't know if, if Brad's with us or not today, but Brad's got COVID. So just maybe send him an email, tell him that you love him. I think it's going to hit him a little harder than others. So hopefully he'll rest and relax. I talked to him yesterday and told him to rest for a few days. Yeah. If, and with any of it, if, if, if Dalton or I can help, Dalton will be around for a couple more weeks before he disappears. So if we can help you guys with anything, please try us first if you can, just so that we can help him get a little rest. But anyway, um, all right, main topic. So technical monitoring review. Dalton, you want to get us started here? Sure, yeah. If I can get the thing to... So I'm going to start by kind of giving you guys an overview um, of our monitoring sample. So this is just an average of the 41 jobs that we monitored, um, just the averages for it. So um, we monitored 41 jobs across seven agencies. And the average year built was 1973, which is a little bit older than the average from our last year's monitoring sample. It was uh, 1976. Um, the average days across um, the state in production was 103 days. Um, on that, that's from the time the auditor um, goes out and starts the audit to the time that the QCI gives a final signs off on the final, that's the average time on a job was 103 days. And that is down from last year, the, our monitoring sample, it was 170 days. So you guys have tightened that up some, and that might've been COVID related stuff, the, the longer average, but um, the average infiltration reduction across the monitoring sample was, came in at 25% reduction, and that is, up a little bit from last year, it was at 23% was the average across the monitor sample. Um, and then the average number of issues per job identified as four, about four issues per job. Um, and that's compared to, there's about five issues per job last year. And that that's a little bit of a skewed number because when I do the average on that, it's more, categories so if one job had multiple workmanship issues i really didn't break that out too good on that but and then the overall accuracy score um, for the technical monitoring as far as it relates to the qci in production was 90 percent is where everybody's technical monitoring is averaged out so um you guys have any questions on that we're going to dive we're going to dive a little bit deeper into, um, well, kind of first, will you go to the next slide? So here's an overview of where the percentage of issues were found as it relates to QCI in production. So I have my monitoring broke into uh, basically three different sections. There's the agency section, which is things like equipment calibration, quarterly safety trainings, on-site safety inspections, issue tracking, those kind of agency things. And that made up about 13% of the issues that I found this year in my monitoring were agency specific or agency issues. 43% um, were production issues. And those are like work meeting quality standards, in progress, worst case draft testing, let's say that kind of stuff made up about 43% of the issues identified. And then 44% of the issues identified were um, QCI closeout issues, which is like the QCI audit, file review, post ASHRAE, post worst case draft test, post combustion, that kind of stuff. So that just gives you an overview of what areas had, what percentage of issues. And then, um, You'll go to the next slide, Turner. I kind of identified the five 
things that have the biggest error rates across across the state sample. Um, and the the one that had the the biggest error, the least accuracy rate or biggest error rate was work meeting standards. Um, and there was four real systemic issues that I seen across that spanned all seven agencies. And those were water heater blanket straps, pipe insulation, um, compressing bad insulation and duct ducts left uninsulated that should have been insulated. Um, with the water heater blanket straps, it was either there, there just weren't any straps put on it or it looked like maybe the crews were under the assumption that the earthquake straps that they were put, putting on the water heaters were replacing the water heater straps. So there was just a ton of, ton of jobs where those were missing. Um, and then pipe insulation, that one seems to continue on from year to year where it's um, either it's missing fasteners, it's installed too close to combustion flues, um, they're, they're using the wrong diameter of pipe insulation, so it's, it can't even close all the way around the pipe. And they're leaving, they're not mitering the corners, so there's corners left exposed or the T's, that kind of stuff, it's just incomplete. Um, and then with the the bat insulation, I'm seeing where it's being when it's being installed in the floor. I've seen it being compressed, and also in the rim joists. So be aware be aware of those. And then ducts being left uninsulated. We had ducts in the crawl space where they're not insulating boots. A lot of times, like they'll insulate some of the runs, not the boots. Um, a lot of uh, return plenums. Where they insulated the supply side, but once it turned into the return drop, that was being left uninsulated. So um, those were the more systemic issues. Obviously, each of you agencies have your own monitoring reports where you can dive in to the specifics with your guys as it pertains to your agency. Um, the next thing on the list was infiltration reduction. Um, there was a 39% accuracy rate across the state. Um, and again, like I said before, there, those averaged out to 25% reduction. Um, only two agencies had an average across their monitoring sample that was at 30% or higher. So there's five agencies that it was below that. Um, and uh, just to put it in another perspective, out of the 41 jobs that I monitored, only 16 jobs actually met the reduction goal. So there's some, as a statewide program, that's, there's a goal there where we can, there's some room for improvement. That's why that's on the areas of focus for this coming year. Um, the next one is in progress, worst case draft testing. There's a 72% accuracy rate across four agencies. So there, there were three agencies that did have in progress worst case draft tests. They got 100%, but the four agencies had missing in progress worst case draft tests. And this is really a safety issue. Um, we need to make sure that your crews understand that anytime they're doing work that's going to affect the envelope of the home, affect how the appliance, the combustion appliance operate. They need to be, at the end of the day, conducting an in-progress worst case draft test. So if they're going out and installing windows and they're going to come back tomorrow and ins insulate the attic, they need to, at the end of the day, after they install the windows, they need to be um, doing a worst case draft test and putting that documentation in the file. Um, the next one is post ashray. Um, there's a 73% accuracy rate, so there's a little room for improvement there. And it's still the most common things what I'm seeing with the post ashray is where the QCI is not putting down what they're actually measuring, um, or they're missing fans. There was a few a few jobs this year where. They didn't think like a range was vented out when it really was. It should have been added. 
Another thing is where they're putting fans um, on listed as a bathroom fan, but it's really in a laundry room or some other adjacent room where it can't really be considered as a bathroom fan. So there's those inaccuracies that I'm still seeing on that post ashtray calculation. Um, so check with check with your people if they need training. Please reach out to us and we can line line some of that up. Um, and then the audit file review. Um, there's still I did I measured this a little bit different than I have in the years past. There's an 81% accuracy rate, um, but it's things just like the wrong square footage. Uh, missing or incorrect appliance data. Um, the audit file will have an inaccurate ASHRAE estimate, um, incomplete XRF reports, air sealing strategies not following priority lists. So it's, it's kind of all a little bit all over the map there, but um, really we need to have your, your QCIs really focus on trying to do a good audit file review. And um, we do have, Turner made a video a little while back. It's on our YouTube channel. I, re, I refer to you guys um, quite a bit when in my monitoring letters as far as for your, your QCIs to go back and watch. It's a good resource that it can really help them understand what they're looking for to check an audit appropriately. Um, and those are, so those are the five areas of focus I want you guys to be focused on as it relates to the QCI and production parts of your program. Um, that's our the biggest opportunity for improvement source. So do you guys have questions? On the air ceiling number two, how many of those homes were under the air changes of five blown? So like they were pretty tight, like already I don't know, homes that were under a thousand CFMs. Yeah, I didn't I didn't compare I didn't pull that. I'd have to go back through and count how many of them were were on the tighter end like that. Um and I know some of them like I held the line right at 30%. So there were some jobs that were 28% reduction, you know, some that were 27, but there were there were some that were and there's quite a few that were only, you know. 7% reduction, 10% reduction. So there's a mixed bag, but I did I did not do that comparison, Zach. So I don't I don't have that with me, but I'm just curious on that. So all right, well thanks. Yeah. No, I get I get what you're saying. And we were I mean like there is some correlation with the age of home and stuff, and we are sticking around. We're still like in the 70s there as far as the average age of home. So it wasn't like we're in super new new homes, but there, there seemed like there was a good mixed bag as far as the age of home, which can typically relate to it being super tight or not. But. Just out of curiosity, if you guys get time, could you chart that for us, like percentage of reduction based off the starting air changes per hour? So like, like have a chart that kind of shows like, so a job with five air changes per hour, what's our average reduction versus Job starting off at 10 air changes or 20 air changes per hour. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, that might be valuable to look at. And I, I do realize a lot of you are thinking about that, but remember that that has not become, that is not in our policy right now. All our policy says right now is that you're required to get a 30% reduction on every home. So, uh, one of the one of my thoughts as Dalton went through that is um, how closely is the work order being followed by the crews when they when they are being directed to do uh, infiltration reduction? Um, we want to make sure that that is happening, that the uh, the directions and and the goals are being met. But you you guys are right. We. We have been wanting to watch that. That's why we've started to track it. So I think that's a great idea. We could we could uh, spend some time uh, digging into that a little bit and see if it's time to write or 
adjust policy on that at all. And uh, there's been a couple of jobs actually, well, quite a few in the last batch we had that were already under five air change power. There's some down as low as three. Yeah. And it's like, well, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. I, I think guys, the lander runs into that a bit too. Yep. And uh, you coordinators at the coordinators meeting that we just had, the overview that Brad gave is a little better perspective of where your agencies are at, because this is just across the monitoring sample, what we're looking at here. So it's not as broad of a view as the actual, because the numbers that Brad um, gave you at the coordinators meeting is looking at all of your jobs. And so it's probably a more accurate average, but um, I still wanted to give you what the average was across our monitoring samples. So, and each and in each of your monitoring letters, I I gave you that breakdown just for your agency. So, but I'll make a note here, Jesse, about about trying to chart that. If there's cool. Thank you. So, there's a question in the chat about whether or not you have to include labor on the infiltration measure, and and the answer is yes. Uh, if you have a three hundred dollar budget for infiltration reduction, that is that is supposed to be three hundred dollars worth of labor and materials. So if you're using twenty dollars worth of materials, the rest can be labor. But I I realize that we're getting into how the sausage gets made, and it gets messy there. But um, but it's a legitimate thing to think about is how many hours of labor can can we put into this before we need to stop and and really the goal is is that the guys that are out there doing the labor they should have a work order that's directing them to the things that are going to be the highest priority down to the lowest priority so that if they do run out of time and money uh, they hopefully done the most effective work first so I don't know if that helps answer that question. Cool. Other questions? So these are things we will be watching closely. Just because Dalton's here doesn't mean that this will be uh, going by the wayside. This, these areas of focus are, are probably going to be where we spend more of our energy this year, as I'll show you when we get to audit stuff in a minute. Hey, Matt. Yeah. Um, I remember we had an agency come and visit us and they explained something to us that at the, it sounded like at their agency, they would let the SIR of infiltration reduction drop below a one in order to achieve their 30% error reduction. Does that sound similar? Or do you know what I'm talking about when I'm bringing that up? There is, there is uh, some stuff in our policy. DOE allows it. You can... Um, spend more on infiltration reduction what it is though is you basically treat it like a uh, a uh, an incidental repair where you could get less than an sir of one on the on the infiltration reduction measure as long as if you look down at your cumulative sir as long as you stay within your cumulative then you can spend more money there's one caveat that that makes it difficult for us based on the way we're currently running the program. And that is that you can only do that if there is no duct sealing in your infiltration reduction strategy. So if you went into the house and did pressure pan testing and you included duct sealing in your infiltration reduction strategy, then you can't, you can't drop below an SIR of one. Okay why doe has set that standard i'm not sure but that is the standard they set and but we have adopted it you are allowed to do that stuff it's in our okay. guidelines okay but so air I'm sealing on. can drop below a one still if duct sealing is a separate measure correct oh, okay so, so if there is duct outside the envelope and you busted out your duct blaster and you evaluate it as a separate measure then then you could drop below an sir of one on your infiltration reduction for sure as long as it stays within the cumulative great that's good to know yeah good question any others all right uh so here's the top five for the energy audit stuff so 
as as many of you know, Dalton has been focused on production and QCI stuff. I've I've kind of focused my efforts on energy audit. Um, the and <clears throat> I have a longer list of things that we'll be focusing on this year, but just to narrow it down to the the top five. The first one is lead testing of all disturbed surfaces. This is the, the number one, not because of the error rate. You'll notice the error rate on the others was a little higher, um, but it's because of the risk to the program. And also, um, I want to make sure that it's a focus because we are raising the bar. So I will be watching it more closely because we're raising the bar. Um, I, I think we may see more issues or errors there. Uh, but basically on lead testing, we, we had a 7% error rate. So three agencies had errors on some of their, uh, on the files that I monitored, which resulted in one finding and one area of concern. And that's the other thing to be aware of is when it comes to lead, that, that typically ends up at, as a finding or a, at least an area of concern, depending on what's going on. So if you're not clear on what is required with lead testing, talk to your supervisor, talk to your coordinator. If you guys are still not clear, if you need additional training or clarification, reach out to us. So Angela, you got a question? Yeah. Um I actually was about the HVAC stuff. So this year in the guidelines, um, there was an update to replacing furnaces. Uh -huh. And I was just curious if you could give us a little bit of the background why we moved that into alignment with crisis. Um, can you give me a little more there? What was yeah, the so, replacing furnaces that you're talking about? Yeah, so previously we were able to replace them once they hit that threshold of like 15 years old. And so we're encountering a lot of furnaces that probably really need replaced, but they're not meeting the new standard to be able to replace them. And so at some point, these people are going to have to come back through the program and hopefully they are a crisis client. Yes. So um, if you have questions on that, I know was that our last meeting or the meeting before that where we covered it? I think it was two meetings ago. So if, if it would help, okay. if it would help, I would say go back and watch that video because it there, there's a lot to it that I don't have time to cover this morning. Okay. Um, and hopefully that will answer the question as to why the change was made. Um, but you are correct that we did uh, kind of reduce the number of furnaces that we can address. Um, if that is a concern and if it's causing problems, collect some data and let us know what's going on. Okay. So Perfect. we, we, uh, I've been concerned for a while that, um, that, that, that standard that we had was a little too low and it, it may not hold water if we are uh, questioned at the federal level about why we're doing some of those things. So that's part of the reason why we backed that up a little bit. But yeah, that makes sense. Anyway. Hey, All right, thank so, you now. Yeah, so number one issue this uh, this last year was the lead testing. Number two issue is, is uh, this itemized cost justified correctly. And what this is, is anytime an auditor puts a measure on the audit as an itemized cost, then they are required to justify why they're doing it or justify why they're allowed to spend tax dollars doing it. Uh, this is the one that had the highest error rate. We had a 44% error rate. So 44% of the jobs that I monitored, they had one or more itemized cost measure that was not properly justified. And, and then there were five agencies that had made errors on that. So we will be watching that closely. We're gonna provide some additional training on it uh soon but um that one i'm concerned about because we've spent money but we didn't document properly the reason why we spent the money so we, we've got to fix that uh our hvac evaluations a couple of years ago we had the uh a technical monitoring from doe and they identified a number of smaller things within our hvac evaluations that they were concerned about 
So I have been watching those smaller things much more closely. And we we did end up with a 32% error rate on that. And and they are correct. Like some of it's it's those little things where we're we're not quite getting the uh, efficiency uh, as accurate as it should be, or the square footage that we're heating or cooling, things like that. Um, those do become very important because that document becomes our justification for swapping out a furnace. So it kind of goes hand in hand with number two. If we don't get our HVAC evaluations right then our justification for doing that as an energy conservation measure is not accurate. So we had a 32% error rate there and, and six agencies had errors. Um, number four, so one, two, three, and five have been on our radar for the last year or two. Number four has not. It, it, it kind of popped back up as, as something with a higher error rate this year, and I'm a little concerned about it. Uh, and that is that we had a 27% error rate on the inputs that auditors were putting in for attics and foundations. And if that was skewed uh, a little more toward foundations than attics, but, and these weren't small things. I, I found a lot of, a lot of errors where three and 400 square feet of foundations were not accounted for. And three and 400 square feet of, uh, of the, the building envelope not being accounted for has a, can have a big impact on your heating and cooling loads. And if we're not calculating our heating and cooling loads accurately, then we're not calculating our HVAC evaluations properly. And we can run into issues where we now have a, we've now replaced a furnace that was not properly justified. So, um, this is one we need to keep a close eye on. I, I do think there, there are a handful of newer auditors that are still going through that learning curve to get this right. But uh, QCIs, this is something that becomes very important for you guys to keep an eye on, uh, especially those of you who have some experience in the program and know what kind of impact that can have. So we're going to be watching that closely. Um, auditors make sure that you are following good um, processes to make sure that all of those inputs are are put in properly uh, for those of you who know me and have seen how I review a file the reason that I notice this stuff is I draw a picture of your job in SketchUp and I go through and make sure that each piece is put in and the guy that came out and did the uh, the monitoring from DOE he did the same exact thing so that that is kind of the standard that we are measuring that against so make sure that we are being very accurate there and then number five we've been watching for a little while we did see some improvement here which i'll show you in a second but we still have a little ways to go uh, we still have a pretty high error rate at 20 percent um and most of that 20 percent, what that was is that so number five says duct leakage testing when required. Um, if uh, those of you who have, were in the class a couple of years ago, uh, one of our fall classes, I spent focused on when do we do duct leakage on a house. I talked about how we, we all had to add three questions to our field collection forms, which are, is there duct? in the home is there duct outside the envelope or the outside the condition space sorry and then is there any duct that needs to be uh, insulated so every agency's done a great job of adding those three questions but, but there's still an issue with making a connection on question number two whenever there is duct that is outside of the condition space then you are required to do duct leakage testing and 20% of the homes that I evaluated this year had duct outside of the condition space that should have been tested to see if it was leaky and it was not tested. So watch that very, very closely. Uh, we will be providing some additional training on it, but, but really we've provided a lot already and, and uh, we just need to make sure you're getting it done properly. Um, this next slide was is supposed to be a training plan for it but it's really not fleshed out yet other than we will be providing additional training on this stuff whether it will be a technical training meeting or 
whether we'll push it out as a as a short video or something i'm not sure yet but we'll be talking about it throughout the year because we want to we want to move the needle um and speaking of moving the needle this this is really cool i like this makes me very happy this shows the improvements that you guys have made over the last year and and i feel like we really have like you guys have done an amazing job um so i took last year i showed you the top five but we really had the top 11 and um based on based on those things this is how we move the needle from program year 20 to program year 21. and so just a couple things like the first one we had a, a accuracy rate of 54 percent on writing our air sealing strategies based on the priority list and we've moved that needle up to a 78 percent accuracy rate so 24 percent improvement is pretty awesome obviously still room to improve but but kudos for doing that uh combustion analysis tapes in the file this is awesome 100 percent accuracy rate which is fantastic um but also just making that 22 percent improvement is fantastic uh these numbers over here are represent four of the top five we'll be focusing on this Uh, but we did have a 15% improvement over last year. So thank you for all that you've done to, to work on that and please continue. Um, and, uh, and then there's a couple items down here at the bottom that I'm concerned about. Obviously concerned enough, they made our list. They're uh, items number two and three for this year's focus. And that is because our accuracy rate actually dropped or ticked down a little bit on them. Uh, on the justifying itemized costs and evaluating heating and cooling. So we'll be focusing on those areas. Make sure we bring those up this year. Any questions on any of this? All right. Um, oh, I have made some changes to, and they're not represented on this slide. I have made some changes to the, uh, the energy audit monitoring checklist. So you guys can access this by going to our resources page and just in the neat audit section, one of these here has a uh, energy audit monitoring checklist. If you'll click on that, it will take you, it will let you open up a copy of my checklist, which I just made go away, sorry. Here it is. Um, but what I've done, there are actually a couple new items that I've added here and I left them in red. Anything that's new from last year or this year on this checklist is in red. So that will be a great tool to help auditors and QCIs to remember some of these top five things that we're gonna be focusing on. Um, but you may also notice if you've been uh, using this tool last year, there are a couple of clarifications and a couple of additions to be aware of. So I highly recommend that you're using this tool to check your files when you're done doing your audits so i won't go into any more detail there because i know dalton wanted to go through the qci checklist would it be better for me to let you sh have the screen or do i just need to open up a document dalton yeah if you'll just go to the WAP homepage just for them where where they can access it oh yeah so the like the resources page yeah yeah so we created a new QCI form um, that we'd like you guys to start using. Where is it at here? Sorry. It's just under your audit stuff. It's it is here. Under the audit. So that final inspection instruments, if you click on that QCI Utah WAP QCI form. Okay. Down one more. This here. one? Okay. Yep. And it'll, it's the same thing. It'll ask you to make a copy of it. Um, so it's a Google Doc, and it follows really closely our monitoring templates. Um, you've got all the building information in there, the agency. And also, a new thing that's added on there is you've got to put your BPI ID number. So you have the inspector's name and also the BPI ID number. They need to be uh, listing that on the QCI form. Um, and it's got some stuff built in so when you put in the work start date and the 
final inspection date will give you the days in production. Some of those numbers that I've been giving you averages on, it'll populate some of that stuff for you. Um, and it is all the cells that you shouldn't be click, clicking in, it should give you a warning. I can't make them uneditable, but it should give you a warning if you shouldn't be changing something. But, um, so it's got, the first section is the client info, and then the next one is the intake file review. And this, so this just goes over the eight different documents that we need to have in the client file um, that you'll want to verify are in there, check in there, make sure they were qualified, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we get into what I call pre-production audit file review. Um, really, your QCI should be the best time to have them review the audit is prior to it going out to production. Um, so then it, they're not finding issues after the fact. And I think a lot of you have implemented that and have started. Um, and that just follows that checklist, um, that monitoring checklist, like what Turner was just showing you. It's pretty similar, similar to that. Um, and it's got a, a spot to check off each item and make notes, notes on it. And then um, the next is the production file review. And again, they should be, the QCI should be conducting this before they go on site. So the job's already been in production. Now the QCI gets the job and they say, okay, hey, go do QCI. They shouldn't just hop in their truck and go out to the job like they should be doing this file review on the production documents um, and learning what's what was done on the job and also making sure these things are in the file before they even head out there because they don't you don't want your QCIs going out to the job and find out oh they're missing they're missing this documentation or something so I need to send it back out you might as well check that in the office so you know you're good to go when you go out to do your inspection you know as far as you can tell through the paperwork that the production is complete on the documentation end of it. Um, and that follows again our, it follows our checklist pretty close to what we have in our monitoring checklist. And my thought kind of behind this form was to have your QCIs checking and looking at the same stuff we are monitoring so that they're catching the same stuff we are. Like they're, their checklist shouldn't be too much different than ours, uh, like it has been in the past. This will help them dive in a little deeper on the file review than the old QCI form. The old QCI form just had some basic, did you conduct a file review with the checkbox? This, this will actually help your QCIs to dive in and deep dive into the audit section and into the production section to make sure that the file is complete um, and nothing's missing. And then the next section of it, you'll scroll down, um, this estimated cost review <coughs> section. So one of, one of the QCI's jobs is to make sure that an accurate audit was conducted. And part of that is making sure that the auditor is putting in relevant costs into the audit. And also this tool will help um, the QCI makes some judgment calls on is there money left on the table for the crews to continue air sealing? Like, did they stop? Did they leave $200 in the budget on the table and we still didn't meet our reduction goal? Yes, I should send it back. Having your QCIs go through this part and fill in this um, information will help them make those decisions. And then it'll help them catch if the auditor is underestimating measures and you guys are actually overspending. And even if it's just health and safety measures, it's good to know that your auditors are up to par on what the costs are at as far as labor and materials and that kind of stuff. So this will help the QCIs keep your auditors in check that they are keeping their costs accurate as they can as far as an estimate goes. Um, so this will help your, and again, they should conduct this before they go out to the job. And this will help familiarize them with what monies was spent on the job and 
what monies are still left on the table. So if they have to do a callback on a measure, they're not just shooting from the hip saying, yes, come back and come back and continue air sealing. They'll actually know how much money is still left on the table to air seal it so then they can help prioritize the air sealing when they send the crew back. Um, so that's the estimated cost review section. And when you put in, when your crews put in the measure names there, they'll auto populate into the next section if you'll scroll down. Turner. So this is where they'll start actually filling this form out on the job. All the measure names were already being there because they'll, they'll auto populate from the, that previous section. And basically the, this part is they're going in and verifying, yes, the materials for this measure that were charged to this measure are present on the job. And yes, this measure meets the workmanship quality standard. And if it doesn't, they can mark no and mark the notes, and then they can um, make a corrective action plan down below. So that's what this section will be for, is actually on-site, verifying materials, verifying the work quality. Um, and I'm hoping by breaking this stuff all out into the measures, it will, it will help them not miss as much stuff. So, um, and then you've got your technical testing and inspection. So this section, those first three bullet points that are the COO things, your QCIs, when they get out to the job, they should really check just a couple things to make sure that the audit, that the auditor picked the right things in a couple areas. And one's the orientation of the home. When they get out to the house, they should just double check and make sure that the auditor did put the right orientation of the walls and that kind of stuff. It shouldn't take them long. Just they should be able to verify the walls pretty quick. Um, the next thing is that the that they did put in the correct depth of the walls. Like if the auditor had in the audit that it was a two by four walls, if they show up out there, just quickly look at the walls and see if they are two by four framed. They don't need to tear into them or anything. You can tell that just by a door, door jam or something. Um, and then the other one is verify that all attics we're on the audit. That's what we've seen this before, where if it's got this house with a few additions or something, it has multiple attics. Sometimes some of those sections will be missing. So if they could just verify a couple of those things on site, it'll help them not miss some of those audit, audit review issues. And then the rest of those checks are your testing stuff, your client education, and then all your testing that they need to Put in the file the photo documentation all that kind of stuff so that's the technical testing section there's a note section down there below where you could record anything from the client conversations or any other kind of notes you need and then it goes into the callback section where you can write down what measure you're calling it back on what the uh, description of the issue is and then what the resolution is going to be and then once they've completed the work, there's a spot for you to initial there. And then that check box on the far right is for, to remind the QCI to actually take those issues and put them into your agency issue tracker. Because we're, we're still struggling with that a little bit. I'm getting your QCIs to take the issues that they're writing down on their QCI form and, and pushing those into your agency issue trackers. So that there's a box there for them to remind them to do that. And then the bottom part is just the completion part where they'll sign, they'll um, put their name, sign it, and date it. So, um, yeah, please have you guys go use this. I'm, it's not gonna be bulletproof. There's probably gonna be some things that we'll run into as you guys start to use it that we didn't think about. But hopefully, hopefully it'll help them walk through a QCI inspection, because it's so much more than just the on-site inspection. This thing's got to start early on, and it's a, it's a process, and I'm hoping this will help them keep it standardized and uh, run a little smoother for them. So anyways, that's, you, that's on our resources tab. Yes? 
Are you wanting that to stay a Google Doc? No, it don't. Okay. It don't necessarily have to stay a Google Doc. No. I just I know to run on their i on their tablets or iPads, it's easier if it's not. So I just wanted to verify. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. I know you should be able to um, make those forms available offline. Is that Turner? You know. Yeah. Yeah, any of the Google Docs, you can click and make them offline. The only problem is on a tablet, the this top toolbar takes up a lot of real estate. So gotcha. it's really small. Yeah, but, okay, but so you have to put it into a PDF form or whatever. Like, yeah. document, you can do whatever. You, you would be OK if we did that, put it into a fillable PDF. Say that again. Yeah. You would be OK if we needed a fillable PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. With any of it, the, like our method though is, if you notice when it, it is a link on the resources page, we've set it up to where, like for the tool that I was showing you this morning, I just made changes this morning and they're now immediately available to you guys. Um, we will try not to make changes to this stuff willy nilly, but the nice thing about going in on these forms and making a fresh copy when you need them is that you will get the most current form at each time. But but we also understand, you know, sometimes this stuff's not the easiest to use in the field. So any other questions on this or anything else we've discussed today? All right, we're a couple minutes over, so let's go ahead and end. Thank you guys so much for joining us, and thanks for all that you're doing. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Have good luck. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. See you. Thanks, guys.